Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning for this R&D Tax Reliefs webinar. Uh, my name is Anthony. I'm a tax partner here at Menzies, um, and I also head up our innovation and R&D team. I'm joined by my colleague, Will, who's uh, part of the team here, and also one of my brightest technical minds in the team. So um, hopefully he'll help steer me through this webinar today. Um, as the title says, um, we're here to talk to you today about big changes for R&D tax reliefs. Uh, and I can't emphasize enough how big these changes are. They are the biggest changes we've seen in R&D tax reliefs for 20 years. So really significant changes, a really important webinar today. Um, and unfortunately, um, I think there's going to be more losers than winners that come out of these changes to the R&D tax relief rules. But our main aim with the webinar this morning is to keep our clients, our contacts informed, um, to make you aware of these changes so that you can consider the impact on your business, your R&D tax reliefs moving forward, and essentially plan and where possible mitigate to ensure that the impact on your business is as limited as, as possible. So we hope you find it helpful. It will mainly be focused on those already making R&D tax relief claims. Uh, and the impact on your, your claims moving forward. But it will also um, be important for those thinking about making R&D tax relief claims in the future. So what are we gonna cover today? Um, just a brief overview, as I say, it's, it's about a 30 minute webinar. Um, and what I wanna start by doing is just uh, talking a little bit about the current landscape and why this is changing with regard to R&D tax reliefs. I think that's important to provide some context um, because just looking at the changes which are significant alone doesn't really tell you what's going on and doesn't really explain the path of travel for the government. And I think that's important. Um, then we will obviously go on to the, the major changes coming in um, from 1st of April this year. Uh, and there's two really big ones that we wanna talk about and go into in detail. But we'll also be talking about enhanced compliance from HMRC. And what that means is, you know, greater scrutiny of R&D tax relief claims, more inquiries. And that's going to be very important as well moving forward. Um, we'd then also like to look a little bit uh, further forward. There's currently an R&D consultation on the go and there's going to be more changes to R&D tax reliefs moving forward. So we'll talk a little bit around that as well. And finally, we'll sort of finish with a summary, some thoughts. Um, some things to go away and think about and, and take some questions if you've got them um, or happy to do those offline separately. What I would say this morning is we're not going to be talking about the classic question of what is and what isn't R&D. That's not in the remit of this and it's a, a much wider and, and bigger discussion. This is more around what are the changes and how is it going to impact those making R&D claims at the moment and those making claims in the future. So I'll start by talking about the current landscape. Uh, and as I say, I think this is important. So just as a reminder, um, R&D tax reliefs were introduced uh, about 20 years ago. So it's back in 2000. And the main aim of the R&D tax reliefs um, and why they were introduced initially was that, you know, economists and the government recognised that there was a strong link between R&D and GDP growth. Um, so innovation, R&D, GDP growth are, are closely linked. And one of the tools the government have in order to stimulate R&D and innovation is R&D tax reliefs. So it was recognised um, all those years ago. Um, they introduced the reliefs. And actually, if anything, over the years, those reliefs have become bigger and more generous. Now, that hasn't changed. Um, you know, the, the, we had the recent autumn statement and some of the announcements in the autumn statement were that, you know, uh, innovation is continuing to be important for the government and the economy. They want to be. They want the UK to be a, a science superpower. They want to fund um, disruptive technologies. Those are all still important. And one of the headline figures that came out of the autumn statement, the government is still committed to essentially funding up to 20 billion pounds worth of R&D by the year 24, 25. So they are still committed to that. And there is an overarching aim for the government to have R&D spend being 2.4% of GDP by 2027. So those are still the target to the government. R&D has not gone on the back burner in that sense. They still see the importance of it. And R&D tax reliefs will play an important role in that. What has changed is that the R&D tax relief claims, in particular made by SME um, businesses, has gone up significantly. So just to give you a feel for the numbers, back in 2014, 2015, there was about 30,000 claims being made by SMEs. 
in 2020 to 2021, that was 80,000. So you can see it's a massive increase in the number of um, SME R&D claims. What that means is the government have now decided to look at R&D tax reliefs, in particular, the reliefs and rates themselves, um, a refocus on ensuring that the UK benefits and that its UK activities being carried out, an increased scrutiny uh, and looking at claims in more detail. Uh, and that's that's the things that are, are going to be introduced that we're going to be talking about a little bit later. And there's three main reasons why this, these changes are occurring and why this is happening. So the first is, as with all things, money. Clearly, there's a cost to the Treasury, a cost to the government of providing R&D tax reliefs. And that's what this graph essentially shows here. They plot broadly what they expect to spend on R&D tax reliefs, and they will have a budget in terms of the R&D tax reliefs they want to hand out. And now what this graph shows is, without getting too lost in the detail, is that as it stands, the R&D tax reliefs, if they continue at their current rate, will essentially... Um, by the time we get to sort of 27, 28, um, grow to a cost to the government of about 10.5 billion pounds. So a really, really significant increase. And I, I guess something that's probably not that sustainable for the government uh, in terms of, of the cost. And it's interesting to see that the SME in particular, that essentially covers almost you know, 7 billion pounds. So it's a real big chunk of the cost to the government. Um, and so that's why they're looking at it and saying, well, you know, this is a significant cost and we can see that it's going to increase further. Can we, can we sustain this? And then there's two further considerations, fraud and error. So fraud would be where there are companies being set up in the UK, essentially shell companies, costs filtered in from overseas. They've got no economic or commercial presence in the UK. They're making um, R&D claims, getting tax credits back, but actually not bringing anything in terms of innovation R&D to the UK. And it was estimated, interesting, I was looking at the numbers the other day, that that's worth about £430 million. Pounds. They, they estimate that there's £430 million pounds of fraud in the SME scheme. So that is a huge number. Um, and funnily enough, there was a case recently where 10 people went to jail. There was 100 claims that were stopped that were, I think it was £46 million pounds of, of R&D fraud that was stopped. So we're talking some, some huge numbers here. Uh, an error that would cover, as I said, those claims have been increasing from 30,000 to 80,000. So big numbers of claims increasing. And the government feel that in an unregulated market, you know, there's lots of less scrupulous advisors out there who are advising clients to make claims that are not necessarily advancing science and technology to the level that HMRC would want. And those spurious claims, if we can call them those, um, are, are pushing the, the cost up to the government. So coming back to my point of, the government may well take 10.2 billion as a cost for the R&D tax reliefs if they felt that these were all genuine claims and that they were getting the necessary output from this investment in R&D tax reliefs. But with that fraud and error, uh, and, and a final point I'll come on to, they probably are not getting the return on the investment. And as I said, this all comes down to best use of taxpayers' money, especially in the current climate. You know, we've just come out of a pandemic. Um, the economy is not growing at the level that we'd like to see, and the government have to be particularly careful in a cost of living crisis about where they're spending public money. And you know, with fraud and error, and, and ensuring they get the best you know return on their investment, they're not currently seeing that in the SME scheme in particular. So uh, again, just uh, providing some stats, they, they're, some recent numbers identify that for every pound of R and D tax relief investment the government make. They're getting private investment under the SME scheme of between somewhere between about 60p and £1.30 back. So not a massive uh, impact. Whereas under the RDEC large scheme, they're essentially getting for every pound they put in between, I think it's between 240 and 270 back. So it's a much better return on the RDEC than it is under the SME scheme. So these new rules actually talking about the forecast and what it means, these new rules they're introducing, they'll reduce the total cost to the government of uh R&D tax relief to about 9.2 billion. So it'll bring the overall cost down. But the interesting thing is that the seven or seven-ish billion that they're spending on the SME, that'll drop to 3.7 billion under these new rules, uh, whereas the large scheme will actually increase. So what there is is a shifting from SMEs to uh, large, larger businesses under the R&D rules. 
and that's about getting the best return for the government investment. So I think that's useful, as I said, to just give it a bit of context, understand why things are changing, and what's the government thinking and the, and the path of travel. Let's dive into the, the most important thing. What are these major changes that are coming in from 1st of April 2023? So these are coming in very shortly and will impact businesses uh, almost immediately. So if you've got a December 2023 year end, for example, you'll have expenditure incurring in this year that will have reduced tax relief. So the main one is the rates. The, the R&D rates under the SME scheme have been significantly decreased. Um, you know, it's, it's a massive reduction. Um, and just as a reminder, we're mainly focusing on the SME scheme today. That's um, companies and groups of companies that broadly have less than 500 employees, less than 100 million euro turnover, and less than 86 million balance sheet. So it just gives you an idea of those, of those limits. But what's happened from 1st of April 2023 is that the extra R&D uh, enhancement that's offered has dropped from 130% to 86%. Now, I don't want you to get too lost on those rates, but obviously it's a significant um, reduction. These are the main numbers to be aware of. If you're a profit-making business and you're paying tax, um, under the old rules, um, you would have got 24.7% tax relief, um, and now you're only getting 16.3%. So if I just put that in numbers, before, if you were spending £100,000 on R&D and you were paying tax, you would have got £24,700 off your tax bill. Now that'll only be uh, 16300 So a massive change, essentially a third reduction. Those other rates are there just to indicate that from 1st of April, we've also got an increase in the um, CT rates for some companies up to 25%. But I don't think we need to get lost in that. The main thing to be aware of is that it's going to be a third less if you're, if you're tax paying. The even bigger issue and probably more important is for loss making businesses. So for businesses where they make a loss, don't pay tax, but essentially claim an R&D tax credit because the R&D tax credit rate is also reducing from 14.5% to 10%. So again, a big reduction. What that means is in numbers is 33.35% going down to 18.6%. Again, to put that in numbers, if you spent £100,000 on R&D and you were a loss-making business before, you would have got £33,350 back, up to £33,350 back as an R&D tax credit. Now you'll only get £18,600. So you can see that's almost half what you were getting before, a really big um, and significant uh, reduction in the amount of tax relief you're getting. Now, it's not all bad news. Sadly, it is very much bad news for the SME scheme, but... Under the large scheme, they've actually increased the rates from 13% to 20%, meaning that the net benefit to large businesses uh, or SMEs subcontracted work from large businesses is 10.53, going up to 15%. And again, we'll, we'll touch on this later on in the webinar, but this is very much a move towards a unified scheme, potentially, uh, where there's going to be one rate for all. Uh, and as I say, that's what they're currently consulting on at the moment. So uh, really, really big changes to the to the R&D tax relief rates and, and sadly negative ones as well. Um, I do think it's just useful um, to, uh, to uh, go through this as, as a sort of worked example and see the numbers because, uh, sorry, I'm just uh, hiding my screen there. Um, yeah, because I think it, 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 there's lots of percentages floating around, but it, it's useful to see it in numbers. So I've got a really simple example here. Um, I don't think you need to get lost on the numbers uh, of the sales and other costs, but you know the selling on the left-hand side is what uh, for a profit-making business it would look like under the current rules. So they're million pounds of sales. They're spending hundred thousand pounds on R&D. They get their extra enhanced R&D deduction of one hundred thirty thousand. They've got other costs of six hundred seventy thousand. They end up making a profit of one hundred thousand pounds, and they pay tax at that uh, at nineteen percent, uh, being nineteen thousand pounds. Effectively, the R&D tax saving that they receive at the moment is that 130,000 at 19%, which is 24,700 pounds. Under the new rules from 1st of April, exactly the same numbers. The only number that changes is that extra R&D enhancement, which is now 86,000. The difference that makes is with exactly the same number, numbers, that company now makes a profit of 144,000 and pays corporation tax of 27,360 meaning the R&D 
enhancement, that 86% is only saving them 16,340. So the, the highlight number here is for every 100,000 pounds you're spending on R&D, effectively, you're losing 8,360 pounds of tax relief because of these changing rates. So a, a significant amount. Um, but the bigger impact, um, the bigger impact I would say is actually for loss making companies, at least with a profit making company, you are making profits and actually you're, you're making money and you're paying tax on those profits. And yes, while we'd like to mitigate and reduce that tax as much as possible, you are making uh, a profit out of the business. For loss making businesses, and in particular startups and tech startups, the R&D tax credits are very much the lifeblood of the business. They fund the development, they keep the business going. And without them, and at these reduced rates, many businesses are gonna suffer and, and struggle to continue with their development activities and get to a point where they're able to bring their products to market. So again, um, some example numbers, You've got a business that's making 100,000 pounds of sales uh, and has, a uh, sorry, a million pounds of sales and has a million pounds of other costs. Does, it wouldn't have to be making sales, but the, the key numbers here is they've spent 100,000 pounds on R&D and they get their extra enhancement at the moment out of 130,000. They end up with a loss of 230,000, which they can surrender for a tax credit, which currently at 14.5% is 33,350. Again, exactly the same numbers moving forward, and it doesn't make too much difference in this example as to um, available losses, even if these losses were, were much more and they weren't, they weren't, uh, they didn't have income. If they've got 186,000 pounds of taxable losses, which they would have with exactly the same expenditure, they'd only get 18,600 pounds back. So again, making the numbers simple, for every 100,000 pounds that a loss making business is spending on R&D, their tax credit is reducing by 14,750. So a, a massive reduction in, in the tax credit they're getting back, essentially almost half um, the tax credit they would have got under the old rules. Um, I'm now gonna pass over to Will because the, the, the next part of this is the overseas costs and a restriction on those. And again, it's an, another big impact on future R&D tax relief claims. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. <laughs> Uh, the other major change that we wanted to mention at this point is that there'll be some restrictions coming into the overseas expenditure. Um, so at present, just background, the UK R&D rules uh, allow companies um, such as yourself to claim costs, any costs that meet the conditions, regardless of where they're incurred, so the UK or overseas. <clears throat> now, as you mentioned, the government are, are very keen at this point uh, to achieve better value for their R&D relief. Uh, in terms of stimulating R&D and boosting the sort of GDP uh, in terms of this sort of investment in, in R&D relief. Uh, the way it wants to achieve that um, is to refocus the R&D expenditure um, with some limitations on the overseas costs that could be claimed. Uh, specifically, uh, subcontractor costs, are, they're only going to be eligible if it takes place uh, you know, in the UK or is qualifying overseas expenditure. Uh, or EPWs, or externally provided workers, uh, which for those of you who make claims will know are similar to subcontractor costs uh, that relate to provision of uh, labour uh, services, uh, can only be claimed if the, the workers provided mm -hmm. are subject to, uh, to UK PAYE, or the costs themselves are, uh, are qualifying overseas expenditure. So the big question, I suppose, you'll be asking at this point is, is what is this qualifying overseas expenditure? Uh, that's this new term is where the costs uh, for the conditions of the R&D to be undertaken uh, are not present in the UK. Um, it's going to be wholly unreasonable for it to be recreated here in the UK, but it does exist overseas. Uh, so I could take a really simple example to illustrate that. Um, if we had a, a seismology, a researching research firm carrying out R&D into volcanoes or, or a new device uh, to better predict uh, when sort of eruption is going to occur. Uh, they, can, they can do the development here in the UK, but they can't test it. We don't have volcanoes here in the UK. So that's, that test phase of the R&D would have to be carried out overseas, and you would still be able to do that uh, claim for those costs here. 
uh, <clears throat> other factors that HMRC uh, say would still be included are sort of geographic factors, environmental factors, uh, or even sort of regulatory or, or social factors, uh, such as the existence of key test facilities that perhaps don't exist here in the UK. Uh, what they have said specifically wouldn't be included would be uh, R&D that's carried out uh, abroad for reasons of cost, uh, which I think is probably uh, as expected, or the availability of workers. Now that latter point is sort of an issue for us, as it probably is for several of you, uh, because many of our client base don't go abroad for cheap labour so much as to access the key skills uh, that just aren't accessible to them uh, in the UK. At present, HMRC haven't provided any guidance as to whether accessing these skills or expertise uh, would count as this qualifying overseas expenditure, uh, whether it be accessing workers uh, or, or this collective expertise and facilities of overseas subcontractors. Um, we're looking to explore this uh, point with HMRC and as soon as we get uh, clarification on that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll provide further details to you. And if you could click over to the next slide. So the reforms are not all bad news. Uh, hopefully you'll breathe a sigh of relief for that. Because uh, the scope of the eligible expenditure and, and actually the definition of the R&D itself uh, is being updated to better fit uh, the modern world. As I said, these have barely changed since, since 2000 when R&D was first created. I mean, if you think back to then, the internet was in its infancy, software was typically run off local machines and servers, uh, whereas now firms are using cloud computing services, combining the hosting, storage, software tools, and all the tool tools to coordinate those. And it is very, very artificial to try and claim only the software element, um, as well as very difficult to actually separate that out. Um, so what's going to happen is that for periods starting after the 1st of April 23, uh, all uh, cloud computing costs used for R&D purposes are going to become eligible for R&D relief. Similarly, if you're paying any license costs for, for large data sets uh, used for R&D purposes, that will also be eligible going forward. Um, that's something that's really sort of emerged uh, sort of in the modern world with projects using big data, big data techniques uh, to approach the problems such as sort of artificial intelligence, life sciences, uh, to carry out uh, the R&D. And so it's really uh, encouraging to see that uh, incorporated within the R&D rules. Um, and then the final point we're mentioning, uh, highlighted on the slide there, is um, as of, up to now, the definition of R&D is, uh, is limited to projects that are aiming to achieve uh, advances in knowledge or capability in, in fields of science or technology. Uh, maths has been specifically included, excluded from that. However, as science technology become more and more technical, uh, some areas uh, are becoming more dependent on the underlying algorithms, the underlying mathematical models behind there. Um, and so it's it's very hard to separate those out uh, from it, as well as, as counterproductive. Uh, the aim of this relief is to promote the technologies that are boosting UK GDP. Why would you want to separate out a big chunk of that work? Uh, the good news is that HMRC have recognised that and are extending the definition of R&D to include mathematics from uh, for periods uh, from starting after the 1st of April 2023. Which moves on to the next slide. So HMRC are also looking to uh, significantly increase the compliance requirements uh, after 1st of April 2023. There is actually some good and bad news uh, with that. Uh, as he's mentioned, uh, that there's a, a growing issue with, with erroneous and spurious claims in over recent years. And uh, so H HMRC's solution to that is to ask for a lot more information to be provided with a claim going forward. Uh, so details of projects, details of cost calculations, and, uh, and also the details of the person um, at the company who approves that claim, uh, as well as the agent who, or any agents who are working and assisting you with the claim. 
that sounds quite uh, intimidating, uh, but the reality of that is that a uh, majority of that's been in HMRC's guidance for preparing claims for, for a number of years now. And so all sort of reputable agents, uh, such as Menzies, will, will already be including it in the report that we prepare for you. Uh, so the main change is actually going to be, uh, be an administrative one uh, with, with, with some extra work required to ensure that it's provided in uh, HMRC's a new format which we, we predict is probably not going to be perfectly suited to the, the, the full range of businesses out there. Um, <clears throat> the big advantage of this is that providing details of the agents working on the claim there is going to help HMRC to build up a profile of the, the less ethical agents um, operating out there who are responsible for the majority of these spurious claims. And so they can target, start to target their own inquiries into the R&D claims appropriately. Uh, so while there's a, a very high level of inquiry um, le activities that are across the board at the moment, uh, hopefully over the next couple of years as they start to build this profile, we will be able to see that uh, sort of decline um, amongst the bigger firms as, uh, as they start to uh, sort of understand who's actually producing the, the poor claims. <clears throat> Final point on this slide that I want to mention is that there'll be also an introduction of an advanced notification. What that means is that first time claimants or, or companies who haven't made a claim in three years are going to have to notify HMRC within six months of the end of a period if they want to make an R&D claim. Now, hopefully that isn't going to impact most of the people on uh, listening to this webinar because you're already making R&D claims. Uh, but for new claimants, it's going to um, limit your ability, firstly, to look back two years uh, for a claim and, uh, and also mean the firms really have to be on the ball um, as notifications will have to go in within that six month period, which in some cases will be before you've even looked to start to look at the preparing the accounts or tax of the period. Now, you can see how from HMRC's point of view, that, that does sort of reward your work or reduce the award for past work done, uh, focusing on sort of simulating future R&D. But overall, it really does seem to have um, little overall benefit in terms of uh, improved compliance, uh, while, while really sort of impacting the benefits of the R&D the, the schemes for startups. And so um, hopefully this is something that we will see modified as it goes through Parliament over the next few months. So the final point then that I wanted to bring to your attention here is that there's also a consultation going through um, well, being run by HRC at the moment into the future design of the R&D schemes. We've talked about two schemes at the moment, the SME scheme and the RDEX scheme. And they're actually looking into whether the two schemes can be brought together into one unified, simplified design uh, in the future. Now, as I said, the Treasury is convinced, uh, convinced for a while that the RDEC does offer better value in terms of stimulating the, the R&D uh, and companies. Now, that might actually be optimistic to extrapolate that down to SMEs, but uh, so the future design scheme is likely to be based on a tax credit design. Um, however, numerous issues uh, would remain with that. So how to design a simple enough scheme to be applied across the board so it's appropriate for all companies, um, how to provide additional support to, to R&D intensive businesses, to SMEs, um, such as sort of startups, um, sort of life sciences businesses, AI, robotics. And this has highlighted as um, the key to industries that the UK is going to depend on going forward. The key point with this is that no final decisions have been taken regarding the design of the scheme or indeed whether it will go ahead, but if it does, the implementation would be from the 1st of April 2024. Uh, um, there has been a, a few um, submissions to Parliament to say, well, actually, if you're looking at the whole design of the scheme, why don't you, um, why don't you throw all these other modifications out of the window uh, until you've decided what you want to do with the R&D scheme? But I think that might just be wishful thinking. Uh, and so I think that the sensible course of action at this stage is to, is to uh, plan for all of the other changes to take place and uh, how, this, how this is going to respond to it. Thanks, Will. 
So um, as a summary, um, sadly, it, it is more bad news than good news coming out of these uh, changes and the new rules from 1st of April uh, 2023. Overall, it's going to be very challenging for SMEs moving forward, but in particular, those loss making companies where they're surrendering their losses for a tax credit because that repayable tax credit is almost going to halve in value. Um, but also those who have significant overseas costs um, because those are no longer going to qualify and that's going to significantly reduce the, the qualifying expenditure for, for SMEs and, and large alike moving forward. Um, there is a bit of good news around the large cloud and data costs, but that certainly doesn't negate the, the rate reductions and the overseas costs. So all in all, it is, it is a bit of bad news. But as I said at the beginning, the main reason we're doing these webinars is to create awareness so you can plan. It's better to be aware of these changes and know that they're coming in and there's going to be a potential funding gap rather than finding yourself in that position a, a year down the line um, and not being able to, to adjust for it. Um, sadly, there is no magic wand or special tax planning that we can offer. The rates are what they are. We, we are slightly limited in what we can do around that. The overseas cost rules are what they are. There is, as I say, some room for interpretation there. Will's touched on it. We're waiting to see a bit more guidance from HMRC and whether we can argue things to our clients' favour, which we'll always do within the confines of the, of the law. Um, but what I would say is the main things to take forward are clearly um, cash flow forecasts and being aware of the reduced um, funding from R&D tax release moving forward will be important for businesses, how you can plug those funding gaps in terms of other grant funding, um, loans, or as I say, just being aware of what the business needs in terms of its funding moving, moving forward. Um, with overseas costs uh, for larger corporates, which are part of large groups, can you look at restructuring? Are there R&D regimes in overseas that are more generous? Uh, is there a branch versus subsidiary? These are very complex um, decisions and need proper advice. And, you know, we can't advise on overseas tax jurisdictions, but we do have HLB who can advise on those matters. Um, so that'll be important. But the, the, the key takeaway I would say is, while the reliefs have gone down, they are still very generous. It might not feel that way at the moment because you're getting half of what you got before, but they are still very valuable and some of the most valuable in the world. So what I would say is you still need to make sure you get those reliefs. And the point around scrutiny and increased HMRC inquiries is definitely a real one. We are seeing more challenge from HMRC. And I've spoken to colleagues um, within Menzies, but also across the R&D network from other firms and other boutiques. And they're seeing a lot of inquiries at the moment. Uh, so that is a very real thing. So we need to make sure that your claims are as robust as possible, something that we always strive to do. And also we need to make sure we're maximizing your costs. Again, something we always do, but even more important now when the rates are going down to ensure we get as much costs into the R&D um, claim as possible. Those will be the key considerations moving forward. As Will said, the position is not finalized. Um, it's coming in on 1st of April and we don't expect that to change. There is a budget coming up um, shortly on the 15th of March or the spring statement. There could be some changes there. And actually the CEOP has been calling for um, a change to some of the announcements that have been made. The ICAW in particular were not happy about the overseas uh, cost restriction because they quite rightly feel that this will um, be a deterrent to people investing in the UK where there's cross-border R&D carried out, which I totally agree with. There was an article in City AM uh, yesterday, I think it was, from the Federation of Small Businesses saying that this is really going to stifle innovation and investment in innovation. And yeah, again, I totally agree with that. So what I would say is, and I think Will agrees with me on this, is that it's a bit of a sledgehammer to crack, crack a, a sledgehammer to crack a nut approach from, from the government. Um, I, you know, as my opening slides mentioned and providing the kind of reasons why they're doing it, I totally understand they've got to tackle fraudulent and spurious claims. But punishing everyone with a reduction in rates, and this being particular, those businesses that are carrying out genuine R&D is hard to take. Um, I think they should have you know, allowed some of the measures they'd already brought in, such as the PAY and IC cap, increased inquiries to take effect before um, uh, reducing the rates. Now, what we might see 
is that once they get some of these spurious and fraudulent claims under control, the rates go back up. Uh, I'm not saying that's a definite, but potentially. And again, what I would say is this is always a moving target. You know, we might have a change of government in a couple of years time. There's budgets and the economy changes year from year. So these are all things that can impact R&D tax release. But at the moment, there's no reason that they're going to delay the enhanced compliance measures and therefore your claims must be as robust as possible to get every penny of R&D tax relief you can. And the final point is we're likely to see more changes moving forward. Will's already touched on it in terms of the consultation that's taking place uh, that we think we're going to move to a single R&D scheme. It, 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 we will see what happens, but I think that's where we'll end up. Um, and, you know, we'll obviously keep you updated with that moving forward and, and as informed as we can. So yes, not all good news, but yes, continue to maximize those reliefs. And we're more than happy to work with our clients and obviously always work with our clients to ensure that they maximize their R&D claims and they're aware of, of how the changes might impact their business moving forward. That's pretty much everything we wanted to cover today. Um, yeah, there's a lot of detail in there. There's some big changes. Um, thank you for listening. and. Yes, if anyone's got any questions, and I think there are some in the Q&A box, um, yeah, more than happy to take them now. Let me just see if I can get into the Q&A box. So a question from Paul, isn't the reduction in savings partially offset by the CT rate going up? You're quite right, Paul, for a, a profit-making business. Um, CT rate going up at 25% means that that 86% extra enhancement has slightly more value. What I would counter that with is, and what I was trying to demonstrate is, if you were still getting the old 130% deduction, that 25% tax saving would have been worth even more. So it is slightly offset, but you're still worse off overall. So a profit-making business paying tax at 25%, getting 86% new R&D enhancements will still be worse off than they would have been under the old 19% and 130% deduction. So it, it's a very good question, Paul. Um, the next one is an anonymous attendee. It says, if I have a year end of 31st of March 2023, will that year enjoy the previous rules? Yes, um, it, they will. So these rules come in from 1st of April 2023. So year end of 31st of March 2023 won't be affected, old rules. Um, and then the new rules are uh, prorated. So, for example, a year end of 31st of December 2023 will have three months at the old rates and then nine months are the new rates. So very good question. But as I say, at least us having these discussions now allow you to plan for the future. Um, One point that's just worth mentioning there as well is that the new rates and um, change there is for expenditure after the 1st of April, 2023. So that, that you'll have to prorate that if your period spans the 1st of April, 2023. Whereas the other changes, the overseas expenditure, the, the enhanced compliance, the um, and the changes to the eligibility and the R&D definition, that will be for periods starting after the 1st of April 2023. So if you're, you know, if you have a December 2023 year end, then that wouldn't actually be until the following year that it would uh, take effect. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, Will, that, yeah, the overseas is a county period started on or after 1st of April 2023. So the first year in which that will impact is 31st of March 2024, year ends um, but if it's if you've got a later year end that won't affect but the rates as I said was the previous answer I gave but it's a very good point and actually that leads us on to some potential planning it is difficult but if possible can you bring expenditure into the first three months of this year um, to benefit from the increased rates now there's a commercial decision around that and a cash flow decision and actually the majority of R&D claims are around staffing costs maybe some subcontractors, EPWs, but maybe if you've got a big contract with a developer, can you bring that expenditure forward? Tricky, but, but possible. And actually to Will's point, if you have got a 31st of uh, March, 2024 year end, and you know you're gonna be incurring a lot of overseas costs in the next few years, can you get as much of that overseas cost incurred in that year before the new, or you know, in an early period before the, the rules bite? And finally, what I like, a very nice, easy question, um, which is, will the recording be shared afterwards? Um, yes, it will, of course, be shared. Um, it'll be on LinkedIn and, yeah, it'll be shared to the participants and, um, yeah, that, that will be available. So th those were the three questions we had on the Q&A box. Um, 
I'm not sure if it's possible for people just to openly ask questions or if anyone's got any other questions, please feel free to type them in the, uh, the Q&A box now and I'm, I'm happy to take those. And if not, um, you've got our contact details there. Uh, the majority of people on this uh, webinar are, are our clients. Um, so do, you know, we'll be talking to you um, and you're, you're more than happy to reach out to your relevant R&D manager. Um, anyone else? Yeah, as I say, you've got our contact details there. You reach out to us and, and happy to have a call to discuss further. And uh, yeah, thank you for uh, attending this morning and hope you found it helpful.